Underneath Berlin, an interconnected structure of chambers filled with the highest ranking officials of the Third Reich was to become the setting for a dramatic conclusion to humanity's bloodiest chapter. Now, over 70 years later, the Fuhrer bunker has remained sealed up and off limits to the public, and many secrets with it. But what happened in those final days? Red flares lit the sky above Berlin at 3 a.m. on April 16, 1945. This was the day 20 Soviet armies composed of 2 million men launched their attack on the capital of Nazi Germany. Unrelentless bombings and mortar strikes lit the nearby forests on fire. Surrounding villages were reduced to dust. As the commander-in-chief of the Soviet army, Marshal Georgi K. Zukov explained, the enemy must be crushed on the shortest route to Berlin. Leading Nazi officials were safe in a bunker deep beneath the Reich Chancellery. This attack had been expected for weeks, so surely they were well prepared. Earlier in March, efforts had been made to dig trenches around Berlin and erect anti-tank barricades. But as the Soviets stopped their advance temporarily, the construction of these defences came to a standstill, as Hitler was adamant that Berlin must be defended from the Oder River. Hitler, knowing the outcome if the Soviets managed to encircle Berlin, dispatched Volkstrom battalions composed of young men and old men, all unfit for service. The Russians, with their air superiority, eliminated these columns before they could reach the front lines. By April 19th, any remnants of German defence were collapsing under the pressure of Soviet firepower. The route to Berlin lay only 40 miles and was no longer defended by a cohesive front. Knowing the collapse of Berlin was imminent, Dwight D. Eisenhower told his colleagues that the city belonged to the Soviets and stopped his assault at the Elbe River. It was at this time that Hitler said, With treachery all around me, only misfortune has remained faithful to me. Misfortune and my shepherd dog Blondie. It was clear he knew the end was imminent. Hitler's bunker was composed of 20 chambers, all sparsely furnished. In front of Hitler's private quarters was a corridor that led to the conference room where hour-long meetings would take place, with many people gathered around a map table. In his room was a painting above his sofa, a strong box for his papers, a portrait of Frederick the Great, and an oxygen tank to ease his mind. He had become increasingly paranoid of asphyxiation if the diesel generators were to fail. The bare concrete walls, damp environment and oppressive lighting took a great toll on the occupants of the bunker. Water regularly failed and drinking water had to be rationed. The smell of diesel, oil, urine and perspiration was pungent. Goebbels described it in his diary as a desolate mood. Hitler's staff noted that his clothes, once painfully correct, were now covered in stains and crumbs. His hand constantly trembled. He knew the game was up, a general staffer noted. Some thought Hitler was deteriorating mentally with each passing day. Interestingly, in his final few weeks, many staffers described Hitler as monotonous, talking only about his dog and not his passion for Germany and the war as he once did. The leaders of the regime were brought together for the last time on April 20th for Hitler's 56th birthday. Goebbels, Himmler, Bormann, Speer, Ley, Ribbentrop and many district party leaders and Wehrmacht leaders were all present. The party was moved to the new Reich Chancellery, devoid of its furnishings and with signs of repeated bomb damage. The following day, Hitler was awoken early and told that the Reichstag and the city centre were under heavy fire. Visibly distraught, Hitler entered the war room. Are the Russians that close already? asked Hitler, before being connected to the Luftwaffe chief of staff, General Karl Koller. Shortly after, Hitler's phone rang again. He wanted information of jet planes from Prague and Goring's alleged private army. The only word Hitler would utter at his disillusioning setbacks was betrayal. News soon reached Hitler that a second Soviet army had broken through the German front and was advancing on Berlin. A short time later, a conference in the Fuhrer bunker began. It lasted hours. Near the end, Hitler said, The war is lost, but gentlemen, if you believe that I will leave Berlin, you are sorely mistaken. I'd rather put a bullet through my head. An anxious silence descended on the bunker the walls still shaking with the impacts of nearby mortars. Hitler exited the conference room and made his way quickly to his quarters. A stunned Bormann, head of the Nazi party chancellery, went from person to person saying, the Fuhrer can't have been serious when he said he would shoot himself. Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel urged everyone to keep Hitler from going through with it. Others tried to remain optimistic, 
pointing to General Wenk's approaching army, among other forces. Despite efforts by many to motivate Hitler, he said he would no longer give orders. He then sent for his assistant, Julius Schaub, and asked him to collect the papers from his strongbox and burn them in the gardens. News of the disastrous conference spread among the ranks quickly. Hewell told Ribbentrop, Jodl told General Collars, and Feigelein told Himmler. The power struggle was imminent, and Himmler put out feelers to set up a meeting with General Eisenhower. Himmler thought he could convince the Allied commander that the SS could be useful and to supply them with guns to fight the Soviets, working out an armistice in the meantime. On the afternoon of April 23rd, Goring placed a call to the Führer bunker, wanting to find out if Hitler had become incapacitated, which would make Goring the new leader of Nazi Germany. Both Goebbels and Bormann succeeded in sending Hitler into a spiral of rage. Talk about loyalty and betrayal was had. An SS unit was ordered to arrest Goring and his men for treason. However, at the same time, both Soviet armies had linked up finally closing the circle around Berlin. By April 28th, it was clear that the Russians had advanced significantly, reaching Wilhelmstrasse. A report making allegations against Himmler had surfaced, and it was quickly confirmed that he had tried to set up a meeting with the Allied commander. Hitler was distraught at this betrayal. Hitler ordered a court-martial of Feiglein, Himmler's trusted subordinate who had been relaying information from the bunker to Himmler all along. He was thoroughly interrogated by Gestapo leader Heinrich Müller the following day. Documents were soon found belonging to Feiglein, confirming he knew about the meetings. Hitler became enraged and ordered he be shot on the spot. Knowing things were desperate, Hitler ordered the map room be converted for a wartime ceremony where he would marry Eva Braun. Goebbels and Bormann acted as the witnesses as both Hitler and Braun declared that they were pure Aryan and free from hereditary illness. A peculiar scenario followed in which many other members of the bunker were married that very night. Hitler left the wedding to draw up his political and personal will. It was clear his mind was made up on the coming suicide. In his will, he protested his innocence and justified his decision to remain in Berlin. He named Fleet Admiral Donitz as his successor for both head of state and leader of the armed forces, citing Navy Code. The following day, three couriers were dispatched with the will and the copies of Hitler's marriage cert. They were destined for Nazi headquarters in Munich, Admiral Donitz and Field Marshal Schorner. On April 29th, Hitler learned that the Allies had pushed deep into Berlin and house-to-house -house fighting was in full effect. He also learned that the German forces would not hold any longer than 24 more hours. Hearing this, he ordered his dog handler to poison his German shepherd Blondie. The dog's death verified the effectiveness of the cyanide pills handed out to all occupants of the bunker. Hitler went to the bunker entrance to say farewell to his dog, and then returned to his room and shut the door. The dog handler then shot Blondie's five puppies in the garden. A stillness and silence descended on the bunker. That night, Hitler got up and went to the conference room. Twenty of his closest confidants were present. He shook each of their hands and whispered a personal message to each. He then addressed the room, informing them of his decision to commit suicide in order to avoid falling into Soviet hands. He then freed them of their oath to him and wished them success in reaching British and American lines before capture. At 5 a.m. the following morning, the bunker was awoken by heavy artillery fire. The Russians had advanced and they were a mere 250 yards from the bunker. Ava Braun went up to the entrance of the bunker, claiming to want to see the sunrise one last time. She was soon joined by Hitler before shelling forced them back into the bunker. After the final meeting in midday, Hitler's chauffeur was ordered to go out of the bunker and get gasoline. At 2pm Hitler ate his last meal in the company of his diet cook and secretaries. Ava Braun was not present at the table. It was a banquet of death. Goebbels once again tried to convince Hitler to leave Berlin, but it was futile. He then disobeyed Hitler and said he would too remain in the bunker. Hitler then walked Goebbels and his wife to the door. Hitler's aide, Heinz Linge, was present and asked to say goodbye one last time. Hitler demanded he join the others in running for the American lines. After saying his final goodbyes to the occupants of the bunker, he met with Hans Bauer, his personal pilot. Bauer insisted a plane was ready and could take him to any Arab countries, South America or Japan. But Hitler refused, thanked him for his service and demanded that his body and Ava Braun's be burned as to ensure the Soviets could not obtain them. 
Trottel Junge, Hitler's secretary, found one of the Goebbels children on the stairs at about 3am in the morning. While the occupants of the bunker were dancing in the canteen to release tension, Junge read the kids a story when suddenly a pistol shot was heard. Hitler's assistant Linge stepped into the room and instantly smelled gunpowder. It's done, he said. Bormann, Gunsha and Linge entered the adjacent room and saw Hitler sitting on the sofa, head bent, eyes open, with a coin-sized shot to his temple. A single line of blood ran down his cheek, and a 7.65mm Walter pistol lay beside him. Ava Braun was sat beside him wearing a blue dress, with her knees tucked up to her chest. Her lips were blue, and her pistol unused. The room smelled of smoke, gunpowder, and almonds. The bodies were carried out into the garden while artillery fire fell. Ten canisters of gasoline were poured on the bodies, and a makeshift torch finally got the fire burning. As they peered through the door of the bunker, sheltering from artillery, they could see the bodies shrinking and the limbs eerily jerking. It was April 30th, and Hitler was dead.